Yeah, as you see up there, uh, nursery is now open for session. So uh, little munchkins are, are free to head back that direction, and they'll have people to help you there. Oh, man, what a, what a week. Did anybody have any interruptions this week in your life, your regularly scheduled activities and programs? I tell you, um, about 15, a little more than that, years ago, um, I was making my way back to the Lord and ended up in a, an Alliance Church in Mountain Lake, uh, Minnesota, and I was, I was raw and I was hungry for truth because I felt like I'd been living a lie. And, uh, and my dad uh, once taught a message about how the interruptions of life become opportunities to trust. And I think he went another direction as well, also not just to trust, but also to serve. And so you might find that to be true in your own life. You might find that to be in the true in the story today. We're going to be talking about intervening grace from 1 Samuel 25. Uh, please join me there if you don't have uh, the word. It's, there's a couple copies kind of around the back. And uh, it definitely benefits you to have the word open as we head there uh, together. But for those of you who haven't been making the journey with us, let me give you a quick update. We've been following the story of David. We're following the ascension to his kingdom, which is quite the tale indeed. It's actually not a tale. It's a true story. David can do no wrong. He's, he's been anointed, the next king in waiting. But he is, he's not obnoxious, and he's not entitled. He's given opportunities before him. Saul, the current king, has a tormenting spirit, but he calls David in to be soothed by the sounds of his lyre by the spirit-shrouded son of Jesse. With Israel fearfully frozen in battle, David, in faith in the one true God, stands up against the giant and the Philistines, seeing God's hand of salvation work in a mighty way. David is God's man, a man of war and a man of worship. David is loved by all. Women sing his praises and men instinctively follow him just to be in his shadow, to feel the ambiance of his glory and success in war, as he found success at every turn. He's esteemed as the Lord's anointed. And so we come to today's story. What of this David? What of his successes? Join me in 1 Samuel 25. Now Samuel died, and all of Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. And then David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Mount whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you and peace be in your house. And peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing all the time that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. When David's young men came, and they said all of this to Nabal in the name of David, and they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? There, is, there are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from whom I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all of this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword, and every man of them strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed back with the baggage. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us. 
we suffered no harm. We did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. They were a wall to us, both night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore, know this, and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all of his house, and he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste, and she took two hundred loaves and two skins of wine, and five sheep already prepared, and five seahs of parched grain, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this fellow was in the, has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed down to the ground. And she fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies shall sling out from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and he has appointed you prince over Israel, then my Lord shall have no cause for grief, no pang of conscience for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord working salvation for himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord of God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you? Unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. And David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, it was holding a feast in his house, like, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. And so she told him nothing for, and, and, at all until the morning light. And in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke with Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you, to take you to him as his wife. And she rose, and bowed with her face to the ground, and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended to her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. And David also took a Hinoam of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. For Saul had given uh, Michelle, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, 
who was of Gollum. Jesus, we come to a text like this and are enthralled in the story. The expert author has written, and you are, of course, the divine author of it all, but we come before you with some questions. <laughs> we come before you confronting some things about our own lives, and we are in need of a divine encounter even right here and right now. So Holy Spirit, would you do what I cannot do? Uh, would you give me power and clarity to declare the words of God well? But would you work in minds and hearts, drawing us to yourself, helping us to wrestle with the challenging things of this text and of our very lives. Be glorified in these next moments. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that was a bit of a long story, but it sucks you in a little bit, doesn't it? Draw you in a little bit to some drama, maybe even leave you a little bit uh, concerned about what happened. But what we see here, uh, as we start into this text, if I can get back there, uh, what we see here is just a, a fantastic literary piece. And I want to show you what's happening. At the very beginning, we don't open this storyline with the cast of characters right away. We start with the setting. We're, we're being told uh, enough about the story to get our attention. And, 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 and we get brought into this, what is God doing eventually? What is this providential interruption that we're about to experience of God? And so we see foreshadowing. We see names like Nabal, which means fool. And, and we see uh, how these details of Nabal and his wife Abigail were placed at the front like a seed, but they'll eventually give full bloom as the story unfolds. What does it mean that he was sort of committed to bad deeds? What does it mean that she is, she is a beautiful woman who is capable of wisdom and acting and discernment? We find out, don't we? But it starts first and foremost within these foreshadowing features with, with, with a progressive revelation, you have this problem, but as the story unfolds like an onion, it seems to take different twists and turns, and you maybe even cry as you take the journey with the author. As we get caught in the drama, fearing the worst for our formidable king in waiting, David himself. So, so the story opens. For the first time we hear of this couple. Uh, the story has done nothing in Samuel of this couple until today. But we don't open with their names. We open with a description of Nabal's wealth. We're told of, of what he owns. Wealthy Nabal, this foolish man with a tendency to harsh behavior. His wife, as we just discussed, was discerning and beautiful. But it's, it's showing us what's happening. It's drawing us to these details, the riches first, riches which become an entrapment for the main, uh, the, the anti-hero, as it were, the, uh, the villain in this story. And so the, the author tells us that, that after Samuel has died, all of Israel has gone to Samuel's funeral. We, we don't know if David and his men did, but in either case, such an event leads to the relocation to the wilderness of Paran. A very interesting uh, detail, but he ends up winding up uh, in the backyard of, of, of Nabal, among Nabal's own shepherds and sheep and goats. But we can be sure of something, that even though the prophet of God, the man through whom 1 Samuel says the word of God returns to Israel, even in his passing, we can be faithful, like the echoes of a canyon, though the voice has quit, the certainty of God's word will continue and the salvation will be his, and he will protect his people. What God has spoken, he will certainly do. But then we get drawn into the, the problem. We're, we're brought into the rising action of this story with an odd request. Uh, see, David sends his, his men to make a request, doesn't he? Um, he, he? He makes this odd request about uh, food, asking on a feast day for something. <laughs> you know... Um, it seems a little bit out of place, perhaps, to us, to our Western eye, right? Long gone are the days where we would even go to our neighbors for a cup of sugar when we're baking cookies on Sunday afternoon, and if this doesn't seem like that at all. This sounds like he's coming over, not on Sunday afternoon for sugar, but on Thanksgiving Day asking for a turkey, right? He shows up on the shearing day and asks for whatever they have prepared. It seems oddly to us. Uh, why on earth is he requesting of his neighbor to provide the culinary components necessary for the feast that he's about to have? And this is where that progressive revelation of the story is brilliantly placed. 
What seems like an odd request, as more and more of the story unfolds, we begin to see more of the details that make this such a justifiable request. So let's look at those details. See, we see Nabal here. He's not just a man. He's a Calebite. He's a, he's a kinsman of David, a, a, a long-lost relative of sorts. Additionally, David and his men weren't just occupying the same grazing spaces. As the story unfolds, we see they were providing a security detail for even one of the shepherds himself when he comes to Abigail says, we lost nothing. Not only that, they kept us safe day and night. Certainly in a, a time where they, they would have expected to lose something to thieves and to those looking to take advantage of uh, the dark of night. But David and his men, they had a very particular set of skills, skills, skills acquired over a long career that make them a nightmare to those who would try to steal their sheep. Taken reference, three people got it. Okay, uh, Nabal's own servant gives us this information. So it's not like asking for sugar at all. It's a family making a request for just compensation for services rendered. So how does Nabal respond? In three phrases, he shows the depth of his own, of his own uh, what, did the, what did the text uh, tell us that he was? Harshness and bad behavior. Who is this David, this son of Jesse? In that one phrase, he disowns his relational obligations, and he denies hospitality, a command for God's people. Should I give my bread and my water, my meat for my servants to these unknown men? Dishonoring a very reasonable request for compensation. My servants, I hear many servants, are running from their masters these days. Adding insult to injury, he's content to take a distasteful shot at David, this unwarranted fugitive running for his life from the incensed King Saul. If a, me, if a movie is wishing to impress a view, viewer with how you should respond with this, the music would begin to intensify something with some good hard Metallica type rock and you'd see slowly panning shots of, of men strapping themselves for war, uh, cocking uh, or dropping in their, their clips, cocking it back, uh, putting on the, the trappings of war to prepare for battle. Uh, but in Old Testament story, they use words and this is what they say. You need to interpret the same thing as what I just described. It said, uh, David says, every man strap on your sword. So they strapped on their sword as David strapped on his sword. You need to understand this is the, this is the montage of warfare happening in literary sequence, okay? We are being drawn in. They are ready for battle, for vengeance, as it were, strapped for vengeance battle. And isn't this interesting? For those of you who were here last week or have read this book before, just, just a chapter ago, we had a man, a man standing in a cave entrance with a crazy king, and he declares in no uncertain terms, vengeance is the Lord's, as he puts a sword on and heads out for revenge. But friends, isn't that how we experience everyday life? The wisdom of yesterday's lessons are all but forgotten and overlooked when we face new problems today. Praise God, the Bible gets us. <laughs> A warning for us, though, as the explicit need to abide in Christ daily. For some temptations are going to come at you. Like a well-marked intersection, you're going to see wrong from right and have time to make your decision. Certainly in these moments, it's important to turn from evil and choose what's right. But some temptations, as we see today, will come at us so quick, we will not have time to think twice, and we will miss the off-ramp of righteousness as we put pedal to the metal, setting a new personal best on the highway to hellish behavior. And so it's so important that we abide in Christ to slow us down to see what kind of temptations and what offerings of righteousness 
and unrighteousness are in front of us. The king in waiting, overlooking his chance at revenge last week, is set on vengeance this week. You should be alarmed by this. But grace inter- intervenes. You see, on an international political scene today, you might, uh, you might feel the need to keep certain secrets, right? In this, especially the political climate we have today, it wouldn't be great if everybody over in the East would know exactly what we were thinking. And so we have something called counterintelligence. This is the, 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 the intentional activity to keep our secrets secure. And I would argue today, in light of this story, that counterfoolishness is equally important. To be ready to guard against the impulses of foolish people employing wisdom. The author makes clear time and again, I hope you saw that, uh, the servants, the wife, his name, the story the author has told you like five times, this is a foolish man and foolish men do foolish things. Counterfoolishness would be a good plan of attack. So, like Abigail, perhaps, maybe we too will find ourselves unequally yoked in our marriages, at our work, in school, in life, in the community. And we'll need to set ourselves to righteous activity, predetermined to do what's right, ready for moments where foolishness spills over to calamity for others. But to do that, you're going to have to avoid the pitfall of self-pity. And in doing so, you'll be prepared in the righteous actions of counter-foolishness. So make no mistake, I have no doubt that the daily life of Abigail was quite miserable. It was probably not very satisfying. But we find that there's this fear of God that leads to this wisdom of a woman, and she's ready to employ that wisdom today. And, and, and not only her, it would be hard to, under, to overstate the importance of the unnamed servant. Did you, did you catch how this entire salvific experience hinges on the actions of an unnamed servant? Maybe you feel unnamed in your own world, in your own life circumstances, but if this servant who, who beheld the insanity and the, what does he say that uh, Nabal does? Nabal railed at these men. If there isn't some servant of Nabal's perhaps even influenced by the righteousness of Abigail, who doesn't see this and and have his own internal alarms going off that this isn't okay and it will have problems. We're going to have problems. If he doesn't stand, it's hard to overstate how important this man's role is in this story. For apart from his bold approach to disclose the details of that dishonorable exchange, the slopes of Carmel would be painted red in a matter of days. So, the consistently reasonable and righteous influence of Abigail was not missed by all. This young man knew he had a wise woman who he could trust with this problem. The sense of this young man, the sensibility of his master's wife brought salvific, salvation this fateful day. But then you catch the story begins to quicken uh, even as scenes begin to overlap. It's kind of like when you get that split scene on a movie. It's, it's the pace of the story is quickening, which would make sense. Uh, the rage tends to set us off, and the story uh, quickens its pace, uh, building up to this inevitable confrontation. And like a, an acclaimed Michelin chef, our author masterfully overlays the bitter and sweet elements that lead up to this component, lead up to this uh, confrontation. One uh, outcome before us, that of revenge. One outcome before us, that of reconciliation. But no room for both. Where will this story go? The wisdom of Abigail, perhaps gleaned from the (laughs) overexposure to foolishness of her husband, and certainly with fear for the Lord, shows faithful her and her hired hands throw together a mini feast to go. Uh, rivaling any modern-day fast casual diner. And as El- Abigail and this reconciliation offering set out, the scene cuts back to David with, as he's still seething with his own rage. This quick cut shows us this oath that David makes. Surely, surely vengeance will be had. And it's actually an interesting and remarkable oath because the last time we saw an oath like this was with King Saul. 
And the conclusion that he came up with was, if I don't get vengeance today, I'll kill anyone. Or whoever eats of this, I will kill. And it turns out to be his son, Jonathan. He needed the redemption of the rest of Israel. Today, David makes no such mistake. He actually says God exercised vengeance on David's enemy, which will prove kind of prophetic. But what we see here is, 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 is still, it's still a consumption, being consumed with this hate. And so the story moves to their interception. Wouldn't you love to be present when this exchange took place? I mean, again, the author does a great job, but did you imagine this? Like, there's this ravine along the hillside of a, of a mountainous uh, pass, and, and David and his men are strapped for battle, and they're descending down into this passageway only to meet not a band of armed men, but a woman on a donkey with food. How macho does David feel in this moment? Does he justify his royal rage? How small must he feel, shrinking? You can almost see to the size of a pea. A little man in a big army up against Abigail. <laughs> An unarmed Abigail disarms David and his strapped mighty men. And in doing so, she embodies the wisdom of David's future son. That a gentle answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 15. So what we're going to do now is take a moment to observe four uh, key aspects to uh, Abigail's speech. Abigail's speech, by the way, this is the longest recorded uh, speech monologue of a woman in the entire Old Testament, and it is a doozy. It is packed with awesome stuff. So listen to this. First of all, uh, what she does is she intercedes and atones for Nabal. She intercedes and atones for Nabal, right? Uh, she makes an appeal on behalf of another. The righteous and innocent Abigail leads the defense for her idiotic and defenseless husband. But she also atones for Nabal. She, she makes amends now, here in this moment, making an offering because she was uh, quick-witted. She puts together this donkey lady delivery process, presenting to David now what her selfish husband had withheld from David and his young men. You know, Scripture tells us that the wisdom of God confounds the wise. And by all accounts, this uh, effort comes across totally foolish. But here, here she is, uh, offering up what Nabal doesn't deserve as she goes before, intercedes, and atones for the foolish man. But you know what? The righteous works of men and women. This is true for us too, guys. Uh, we must not have righteous works be contingent upon the prior demonstration of justice or deservingness, deservedness on the part of another. Like Abigail, all who wish to join her like this, to live uprightly, we, we must do so completely aware that those will be like Nabal and will have to do justice on behalf of those who won't. And like David, will exercise righteousness towards those who are bent on retribution. You know, some of us in this moment, we need to pay attention. We, we don't even see that we're doing it. We don't even come to realize that we make the, the righteous actions of us toward others dependent upon whether or not they're deserving of our obedience to God. How insane does that sound when I say it like that? We think that our obedience to God is optional if those who would benefit from our obedience are undeserving. We think the commands of God to love others unconditionally apply only to those who deserve it. And by doing so, we unwittingly put ourselves in God's place as judge of the hearts and intentions of others. See, this is the wisdom of God that comes across as foolish. And this is no merely uh, Old Testament uh, moral of the story. In fact, in Romans 12, we see much of the same repeated again. 
Paul says there in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, he'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't you see, <laughs> friends, that acting righteously isn't really for those who've offended you. No, 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 no. It's unto the Lord as worship. And consequently, it's your necessary response of worship that will keep you from entering into the same level of depravity and evil that has come to offend you in others. And so Abigail, <laughs> Abigail, wife of the fool, goes forward and intercedes and tones for Nabal. But that's not all she does, not even the half of it. See, she also moves on to this prophetic diversion of David's unrighteous intention. I, it sounds like a lot of words, but all I'm saying is she, she, she acts in such a way that if she would not act, she, she affirms what David does, even though David would never do it if she doesn't intercede in this moment. Let's read about it here just real quickly in verse 26. You know, we, we see the text uh, tells it to us like this. When the Lord, she speaks to him, the text tells it to us like this. Uh, Abigail speaking says, Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil be as my Lord, as Nabal. You see this prophetic diversion? <laughs> you see what she's doing here? Uh, she's affirming that which didn't happen. You didn't go exercise judgment. You didn't take vengeance into your own hands. And she does it precisely in such a way that keeps him from the evil he had set himself on doing. Applauding, applauding the honorable actions of this king in waiting, even as she herself takes on the blame of her husband for his foolishness, for his ineptness. What a woman, interceding and atoning for the unrighteous, prophetically uh, disrupting the unrighteous intentions of David, and finally now affirming in David's eventual ascension to the throne, encouraging him, stay the course. Listen to these beautiful metaphors, this divine affirmation and encouragement. Look at what she says here. She says that surely, surely, if men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord, the life of David, will be bound in the bundle of the living, in the care of the Lord your God. Do you get it? It's as if it's this baby, David, like a baby, bundled in blankets, warm and cared for, secured in the ever-protective oversight of a loving father. That's David, protected by God. And what about these enemies that are pushing in against him unjustly? She has a, a metaphor for them as well. She says, and, and, and look about these enemies. In the lives of your enemies... He shall sling out from the hollow of a sling. Whoa, how's that for a, a, a jarring metaphor of remembrance for David? The enemies would be like a sling rock, as it were, sent out away far from the, the, the ability to cause calamity to David. What a great reminder, what a specific reminder of the former salvation of the Lord. See, even as the Lord brought swift and just destruction in the valley of Elah, the loudmouth giant fell, right? Yahweh can still be trusted to save his people. David, pay attention to Abigail now. 
that he will still yet save his people. He will still bring about justice for her enemies. And finally, she makes an honorable request of remembrance. After all of this, interceding and atoning for Nabal, diverting against his unrighteous intentions, she offers this affirmation and encouragement certain of David's eventual kingdom, and then just simply asks, remember me. <laughs> remember me when you enter into your kingdom. She enters into that line that even Jonathan and Saul have gone before us in our story and done, acknowledging the inevitable that David will be king, and when he becomes king, use that place of authority and established royalty for the good of the servant, in this case, Abigail. We can't be sure exactly of what she is intending in this moment, but we know this. Whatever it is, it is good for Abigail. It is good for David. It is good for the kingdom of God. And thankfully, we don't have to speculate for David. Well, he'll show us eventually what he does to honor this request. Thank you. Have I just been yelling this whole time? Okay. Good thing God gave me an outdoor voice. That's my, that's what my mom used to say. <laughs> okay, um, rejoicing. Let's take it home with rejoicing. And this is why he's rejoicing. The Lord restrains. Do you rejoice when the Lord restrains? Or do you treat the restraining and loving hand of God like a muzzle? Do you try to buck away from it, not trusting his intention? Three times, the author wants you to get this. God wants you to get this. Three times, David praises God for restraint. If you would not have interceded, I would have destroyed them. And on his, you've kept me back, verse 39, you've kept me back from doing wrong. You've restrained me. David's been kept back from bloodshed and vengeance, from evil, and from acting in the very evil that he experienced, returning evil for evil. So there's two parts to his rejoicing. The first is the foremost. Above all, he's acknowledging God's hand in this entire story. The ultimate worship begins and ends with Yahweh, whose grace intervenes. But how awesome that he uses people like us, servants, as, as those serving up the promise, the reminders that we need of the promises of God, the truth bombs that restrain us from the evil that our hearts are purposed to create. And he praises God for Abigail, his servant. He rejoices that grace has intervened and restrained, but not only that, he has rejoiced in the Lord's vengeance. How does that feel? When David heard that Nabal was dead, he blessed the Lord. Kind of makes you feel a little funny, doesn't it? We don't like that one. But I want to ask you a question. If we're honest, what does it mean to trust God with the injustice around us? Because certainly we can't just look away. What happens when you look away from injustice? What happens when you leave mold in a wet basement? It multiplies. So what do you think justice looks like? It sure better not be you bearing a sword, or it would be just like what David was going to do. Bloodshed against everyone who crosses you. What does justice look like? And if God exercises justice, if God does it, is that not a demonstration of what a holy God alone is able to do? And if a holy God has acted, are you going to disagree with it? Are you going to scorn it? Or are you going to worship the God who can know rightly and act in accordance with his character? Perfectly. Every time. So we feel uneasy. I think that's okay. We, we should, because we're not God. Pra Praise God he doesn't bring, bring the wrath immediately to my life. But we're uneasy with it. I think that's okay. That's the tension we're invited to live in. Check this out. Yeah, how many of us have ever been reading through Psalm 139? We just love it. We're swimming in this beautiful picture of an intimate God knowing us perfectly. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast the sum of them. If I could count them, ha, more than sand. Even when I wake up, I'm just, I'm swimming. I'm swimming in the presence of God, and I love it. Oh, that you'd kill the wicked. 
This is not a superficial jump. This is literally verse 17 to 18, okay? Or 19. Slay the wicked. O, o men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Of course, he's saying this as king of Israel, by the way. But still, next line, you heard this morning. So search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous and offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. What have we just read is David himself struggling with this tension, him doing it uniquely. See, you and I have each been given gifts and abilities. The gift that David received from the Lord was one of tending to God's flock and his people, and that included warfare. So when he says, I hate your enemies, God, why? Because they hate God and hate God's people. They're literally trying to take his life. Oh, but search my heart. Would my love for you never be confused with hatred for them? I need you. Because if you give me, if, if my, my calling in life is to shepherd your people, which means protecting our borders and advancing your kingdom, it's gonna, there's going to be bloodshed one way or the other. May it be righteous and justice for you. But if I ever begin to get an appetite for this, if, if, if the blood of the sword is ever something I enjoy, woe is me. May I never confuse my love for you in doing what you've called me to do with a lust for that which is unjust and inhumane. And frankly, it's the same for us. How many of you have ever noticed that the places you most likely fail and struggle in your life are the places, the flip side of it, is your best blessing and gift to the world? So, so search us, God. May we be in love with you, bent on faithfulness. So, his very means of grace. Thank you, God, that you do that. You know, this type of invent, uh, in intervention of grace um, is only available. Do you, think, do you think this is only available for the superstars of Scripture? Or do you think God's invited us into this experience with himself? Is this not the prototypical means of our own maturity, of leaning on him, not just to save us, but to keep us safe? I'm so thankful that Abigail intercedes and atones for this foolish man in her life. And I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ intercedes on our behalf, atoning with his own shed blood as payment for our sin. See, there's one, this God, one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all, one who would intercede even for sinners like us. Oh, praise God for our sake. He made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us that we can become the righteousness of God. Praise God, Jesus intercedes and atones for us. And I'm thankful, Abigail, she intervenes. Intervenes in a moment David most needed to interrupt the evil he had purposed to do. And so too, am I so glad our Father in his wisdom, gives us off-ramps to our own temptations, because therefore, anyone who thinks they stand, take heed that they fall. But be encouraged, brothers and sisters. No temptations overtaking you, except for that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with that temptation, will provide you the way of escape so that you can endure it. A text like this is sobering, but I praise God that through Jesus Christ, we've been rescued from sin and Satan through a perfect substitute. Praise God that Jesus Christ himself restrains us when we are bent on evil, sending a timely rebuke from brothers and sisters from the word itself when we need it most. Praise God that with all certainty, 
we can trust the inequity of our lives, situations, and circumstances to the one just judge overseeing it all. Father God, we come to you thankful that your word speaks. It does not return void. It works a redemptive work in us even now. So Holy Spirit, thank you. Continue throughout today and this week to remind us of these truths. Would we, like David, come to the end and be like, praise God, you have kept me back from evil. Praise God, you have saved me from the consequences of my sin. Praise God that even now you'll send people. Would I not be so heavy-minded heavy to miss it or hard-hearted to receive it? Finish the work you promised to do. And thank you. We can trust you for it. Amen.